Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We have a special guest in the building. We have Miss Pat. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Pat. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Happy yes. to have you. Now, for people Thank that don't you. know who Miss Pat is, you want to uh, break it down here a little bit? Yes, me to break it down? Yes. Miss Pat is right here. And I just want to say it's such an honor to have you, Miss Pat. And you have such an interesting journey. But you founded VP Records, right? Yes. And for wow. people don't, that don't know about VP Records, we want to talk about the history of that and how you got to where you are. But just tell us how important VP Records is for the reggae and for the whole world in general. <laughs> VP Records for me, I started it very, very young. And uh, it's a journey. It's over 60 years. And I love every minute of it, and I'm very happy that I'm still here, high up in age, but I enjoy my journey for the last 60 years. And I'm happy to see my reggae music has spread all over the world, and I am being blessed with all who helped me to reach this stage. Now, Ms. Pat is from, you're from Kingston, Jamaica, and you came over here when you were young, correct? And you yeah. created VP Records. The only reason I know is uh, my mother-in-law is Chinese Jamaican, and she came here from Kingston, and she tells us the stories all the time. So break down how difficult that was, because she always used to tell me that they would send one relative over first, and that one relative would bring everybody, you know, to send for everybody, as she would say. Yeah. Yes, as I said, I came here in 1977. But mother, my um, brother-in-law was living here before I did, so he was a help to bring us over. And then I, my husband came first with my two sons. And uh, three years after I got my papers, then myself, my second son, and my daughter came. And what made you think of creating VP records? At the time, reggae music was hard to get. It was very hard to get. Even the time when VP records was around, that was the only place to do it. So what made you say, you know what, I want to create VP records and have a, a, a brick and mortar store in Queens and be the outlet for all Jamaican artists at that time for the, for decades. A Caribbean artist. Caribbean yes. artist for decades. Yes. Well, long before that time, I was also doing music in Jamaica 20 years before. You were doing music, 18. you were doing songs? Yes. So I spent 20 years on the counter at Randy's record. Mm -hmm. And um, 20 years after, that's when we came here. Now, Miss Pat, this is all in her book, too, by the way, because I want to make sure we know Miss Pat has a book, My Reggae Music Journey. Beautiful book, the most amazing pictures in here. You have, like, all of the iconic artists from uh, dance hall, from reggae, all of that that are in this book. And they all had to pass through Randy's and VP Records at some point in their career. Yes, it has been, been, it has been a journey. As I said, I started very early. Mm -hmm when Jamaican music was just about to start in like uh, maybe 20 years ago, 1958, when we got our independence in 1962. That was a big, big year for us. And uh, we was invited to the World Sphere here in New York. Mm -hmm. And that was a great, great thing for us because we were able to spread ska at that time. Ska was in and we brought ska with us. And from ska we have come right up <laughs> 60 how, years after. <laughs> how difficult was it to create VP Records? Very difficult. When I came here, they knew Bob Marley, but they didn't know all the other artists that we had in our genre. So we had to start 20 years backward, small space, and start all over again. I would go to Brooklyn three, four times a week, trying to sell a couple of 45 records. Wow. So um, it's been a journey, but we love what we do, and we stayed here over 40 years now doing the same thing. Uh, the embracing Jamaican reggae music and also soca. We did dipped into soca. Maybe 20 years now we started to do soca. Did the regular labels try to shut you out because here you are, independent, uh, Chinese Jamaican, you know, and at the time, all the labels were ran by white corporations, and you were kind of the only independent out, and you were making money. You were bringing artists in. You were the only place for Caribbean artists. Did they try to box you out and push you out at all, or even try to buy it back then? 
Well, you know, I should say we had a core audience, which we should try to service. And little by little, everybody knew about us. And at one time, we, you know, we do telemarketing. We, we didn't know a customer. There was a few white big labels here, but they didn't stop us because we had a variety of, of music. We brought in all the small labels as well as the popular labels. Mm -hmm. So we were really a big one stop. At one time, I had over 600 customers selling all over the country. And I'm blessed because we didn't have any money to advertise, but we use a lot of flyers, pamphlet, all the information we can. And I was on the phone. We started telemarketing, so we had to have all the music in our head. We didn't have computer to write on. So if a customer would come and ask us for music, we have to know which record they want, what, what um, LP it's on. Because 20 years before that, I stayed on the counter, so I know all the singers, all the producers, all the label, how much version is in a song. Sometimes the customer doesn't know the name of the record, so they'll hum it for me and I'll find it for them. That was definitely me when I used to go to VP Records because I knew the name of no songs. <laughs> I'll be humming all of them. Now, Miss Pat, before we even start with VP Records, let's go back to Randy's in Jamaica, right? And how you guys started, or how you started even that business, because uh, that was something that just wasn't being done back then. It was you and your husband who started Randy's, and just tell us the idea behind that, because you've always been a hustler. Yes. <laughs> At 18, my husband was working with a jukebox company. Jukebox company is money that you put in the, the machine and mm -hmm. you pick your records. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of rejects from the jukebox. It was then American records, all American records, no Jamaican records. So we bought them out from the company that he worked with. And that's where we started selling old jukebox records. And that's what our anchor and later on, we developed in selling one, 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 one LP, like Percy Slave, Jim Reeve, Sam Cooke. All those were the, the latest because it's R&B and jazz. And I don't even think we knew about hip hop at that time. Mm -hmm. 80, 60 years ago, we didn't hear about hip hop. So that's how we started selling news record. And we developed a studio afterward, Studio 17. And my store was at 17 North Parade, where it was the heart of Kingston. And everybody gathered around. We have Chris Backwell passing through. We have great producers like Lee Perry, Scratch Lee Perry, Bonnie Whalers, Scatolites, Jammies. So I got to know all the singers and I got to know all the producers. Even Bob Marley came through, right? Even Bob Marley pictures. came through when he first started with Lee Perry. So I was born in the music, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I developed the music. And I get um, to be friends with the producers, the singers, the customer, record fans. We had a little spot named Agla's Rest. I mention it in my book. It was where everybody hung out, both the producers, singers, everybody hung out, record fans, buyers and sellers, people just singing art contracts just on a piece of paper mm -hmm. and singers and then if they wanted a mu musician or a singer upstairs they would just call downstairs and the singer would go up so it was, was an exciting time in the 60s and 70s why why a record store well because my husband worked with a jukebox company and that's what we started with old jukebox records and then from the jukebox records we um start to produce our own music and also had a studio where we were very successful in the studio because it was not only very, it was cheap, it was like $20 per hour. And uh, if the singers didn't have enough money, we'll still do the recordings for them. And uh, it was in the heart of Kingston, so it was, we did mixing, mastering, cutting the acetate, and they could come downstairs and listen to the records being played by the customer. So we get first hand information about the song. 
So that was a great asset for us. And you would scratch off the names on the albums, and right? Yes, they would have pre-release at that time because sound system was a big thing for us. So I guess, you know, when you buy a record, you didn't want the other competitors to know what's the name, so you scratch it and we right. call it pre-release. <laughs> <laughs> and that lasted maybe for a month and then you'd have a general release. Whereas uh, when it's pre-release, it's much more expensive. Mm -hmm. But sound system was a big help for us because the radio station did not play Jamaican record at first. Now, VP Records, VP is Vincent and Pat. That's the name? Yes. I just figured it out. Okay. <laughs> that's that's our first name, Vincent, Vincent which is Pat V, Records. and Patricia, wow. which is P. So we just call it VP. When now, we went to register, we didn't even know a name. So we just, okay, just put in our name. <laughs> and it so happened that it was unique after. <laughs> and you also helped artists. I, I heard this. I don't know if this is true. But a lot of the uh, Caribbean artists said you would help them get the proper paperwork to come over here to be able to perform and to be able to come over here and work. A bunch of artists that I've dealt with said, no, VP helps me with that. Is that true as well? Yes. You know, we have to do the proper papers. So um, we had to help them. Mm -hmm. Who do you think has been the biggest crossover artist? Because I, I, I would say when I was talking to Spice, she was telling me Sean Paul was probably... You know, sign a VP, and then you guys did a. Do you do a deal with Atlantic with Sean Paul, or do they? Does he sign directly to Atlantic? How did that work? No, Sean Paul was signed to us, but when he started to make the hits, we coupled with, collaborate with Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And so, if you had to say for yourself, who has been the biggest success as far as sales, as far as crossover? Would you think it's Sean Paul? I think so. Because at that time, when Sean Paul came on the scene, hip-hop was very big then. And I think they associate Sean Paul with hip-hop. So I think, I think, you know, when I came, it was just all Bob Marley they knew. And I thought they would have associated Bob Marley with Sizzlers and the other roots music. But it didn't take off as much. It was the, the dance hall, Yellow Man so on that that the dance all that really Bujaban and Beanie Man. Did you watch uh, the verses? Pardon? Did you watch the verses battle? You know how they had that big um, online virtual battle during the pandemic with Beanie Man. Yes, and with yes with the very song. Did you watch it? Yes, I did watch it. They shouted you out too. I I, I really liked. Um, I like everything in it because I think because of the pandemic, everybody was at home, and this was like a fresh new uh, excitement for mm -hmm. everyone. So we got a lot of response and was very happy that everybody liked it and um, enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. how, how did you transition from a record store to a label? Well, in Jamaica, we started out as a record company selling records. And afterward, when we built a studio, it was not naturally. My husband did independent Jamaica in 1960. Two, I think, and that became a big hit for us because the radio didn't want to play it, but the streets were singing it, so they were forced to play it. And that's how we started, to make our own records. And uh, as we go along, we just do, every day we try to do something better. Didn't plan it, didn't go to business school, but we just follow our instinct. And there was a lot of people that helped us along the way because we were in the heart of Kingston where everybody sang. In Jamaica, we are gifted for singing because we sing when we're happy, we sing when we are sad, we sing when we are working, we sing in church, we sing on the street. So we are blessed that Jamaica is gifted for singing. Mm -hmm. You talk in your book about the connection between the sound systems and the Chinese grocery shops. Can you just explain that so we can see the scenario in our heads, what that was like? Well, yes, there's a lot of um, Chinese that went into the music business. We went in the business as like uh, in the business side because we didn't sing. But if you can't get your records sold, how are you going to come? How are you going to get an income? And I think the Chinese shop made a big impact on the music also, because the Chinese shop had a store, it had a, it had a pacer where everybody would gather to know what's going on in the country. And that's where the sound system would hang out, so the artists would naturally be there to sing also. So the, the Chinese shop has a lot to play. 
And you have maybe about seven, eight different uh, families, not only musicians, but they also are producers and quite a few singers too. Mm -hmm. Icon, I remember way, way back. Mm -hmm. and, and quite a lot of Chinese are in the music business, but uh, more than the business side too, producing. You have Channel One, you have Beverly's, you have quite a lot, lot of and also stores. And you have Byron Lee, you also have um, quite a few Chinese, that Hone Pressing Plant, Dynamic Sounds, that has pressing plants and uh, produce records. How did the pandemic affect the uh, record store, the actual store? Oh, it was a very hard time for us because we couldn't do any more shows mm -hmm. and we couldn't produce, we couldn't go in the studio. But I think the pandemic has helped us to make other resources to develop the music by helping the artists to showcase them more. And uh, even records that was made 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. people wanted to know about the old singers and how they performed. So I think being locked down for almost a year, we have also developed more strategies mm -hmm. because we have Zooming now and we have quite a other things that we can do streaming. So we gone from we went from 45 to LP, to CDs, to cassette, cassette and CDs, and we have no streaming. I always wanted to know, you know, with um, reggae music, how does that work, right? Because there'll be one rhythm, and 30 artists will be on that one rhythm. So how does the producer get paid? Like, how does that work? Because you don't see that in any other genre but reggae music. Or Caribbean music? Well, when we were in Jamaica, it's a lot of competition with the singers and the producers. So if one makes a hit with the rhythm, the other one try to make it better. So they all jump on the same rhythm. It's very, very interesting. Not only the singers, but the sound systems. Sound system was a big thing for us mm -hmm. because all the sound system compete with each other. Who has the most fun? Who is doing better at, at this dance? So there's a lot of competition goes on. So if you have a hit rhythm, you just version it. Actually, version came in at the time when, when I think it was the old 78. We didn't have anything on, on the other side. Mm -hmm. So we take the same song and turn it into a version. You could take out the words, you just make it drum and bass, or you can make it a version with DJs doing it. So it has developed because of the competition. Everybody wants to outdo the other, whether the DJs, the sound system, the producers, everybody. It's a competition all around. Does the producer get paid for every time it's on a different album? or? It well, I don't think so in the past, oh, but man. no, it's different. Yeah, it's different <laughs> you now. have to get <laughs> you have to get clearance and you have to to pay your share. It's in the past we could shake hands and we split our whatever the, the conversation is, but it's different. Gotcha. How, how was Much it work? Different. I'm sorry. How, how was it working so closely with your husband? Well, my husband did a different job from I did. I was in charge of the shop, the sales and the marketing, and he did the studio. He was very sociable, so he knew all the artists, and he was very sociable with them. They came in the studio as they are. Sometimes they didn't have shoes on. Wow. So, okay, he was very sociable. And we try to help everyone, you know, regardless. Miss Pat, what about being a woman in this business, right? Because look at you, how tall are you, 4'11"? Yes. Four foot eleven. Not when she's staying on her money though. <laughs> <laughs> so how is I don't know if the woman? money came first. <laughs> I think you're helping others and the money will follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well back home I didn't know I was invaded into a man's <laughs> man's job. I was just working. But when I came here and we were doing telemarketing and they would say, Can you put on a man for me? I said, Why? He said, well, I don't think you know what I need because, you know, I don't know the name of the song, but I can hum it or I know who sings it. 
So you test me. I know it. I spent 20 years on the counter. I know all the songs. So after that, they realized being a woman doesn't mean you can't learn your trade, you know. Mm-hmm. So I learned fast, and I had to learn hard because I don't go to the dances. So I had to just learn and listen and ask questions and who sing that, who produce it, who was the backup singer, do they have 10 version behind it, who did them. So I learned a lot of lessons by on the counter every day for 20 years. Actually, I used to spin the disc on the counter too. Wow. <laughs> what about the women artists? Like a well, lady star? Well, at, at first it was, we didn't have much, you know, we had, we had the eye trees, which is uh, Rita Marley, Marcia Griffiths and Judy Mott. Those were the three I knew. And gradually, as you go along, you know, we signed uh, quite a few women artists. And I'm blessed now that they are, they were only backup singers. They weren't really individual singers, but they are coming up. But we need more women on stage. <laughs> how, how, how was Bob Marley? How was it like working with him or just knowing him on a personal level? Bob Marley is very shy, not who you see on stage. When he was about 16, 17, he used to pass by the store. He was always going to play football with his friend Skill Cole. He just came, look around for his friends, and they would leave. But Lee Perry, Lee Scratch Perry, was the first one that um, brought him in the studio upstairs and then uh, made his first new LPs. Did you, did you know he was special? When did you, when did you no, realize he was special? No, nobody knew everybody. Everybody sang in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Even when Bob Marley, Bob Marley made a hit in, Amer- in America first and in England before we realized he was a... His, his manager, Chris Blackwell, really trained him, teach him, and showed him the way, and he was accessible too. And he, he followed instructions. Uh, but when you first knew him, nobody knew Bob Marley would get hit, because everybody sang. Mm-hmm. So when he became a hit, we had to brush off all the mm-hmm. Bob Marley records, because they were hot at that time. But I would say nobody knew a hit. Hate is not born in the, in the studio or on the boardwalk. It's born in the streets. Yeah. They always ask me, how do you spot a hit? I would say, not in the boardwalk, not in the studio. The people on the street makes the hit. Now you guys, Together with the radio station. Now you guys created, or I don't know if you created, I was going to ask you. I remember um, as a DJ, the best thing about VP Records, especially for somebody who wasn't playing Caribbean music all night long is yeah you would the strictly the best series right strictly the best volume mm-hmm. one strictly the best volume two where it was a collaboration or all the hottest reggae music coming out at that time but I'm just thinking about it now you guys were the first ones to do that and then all the other companies started doing that as well there was no way to trademark that or nothing because they stole it they stole your whole thing <laughs> even the names well I and I would say in, in 19, between 1960 and 1970, back in Jamaica, I was the first one that put a various artists LP together. Because the artists, the producer have different, they don't have a hit, so I said to them, why don't you put your hit, your hit, your hit, and make one LP, and we would share the money. And they believed in me, and I did DJ Choice. That was the first various artist. You was the first DJ and, Khaled, right? Uh, there. Yes, <laughs> I was the first one who convinced them. Put a hit, put all your hits together, and then we would share the money for all of us. So that's what they did. And it was a dance hall LP. It was really a DJ LP. Because at that time, DJ was very strong on the market. So I was the first one, it's DJ's Choice. Wow. And then when I came here, we continue with reggae gold, soca gold, and then strictly the best. Because there's so much records come out a week that we try to put all the hits on one LP for people who are, that are not sound system. The sound system and the regular reggae fans have all the singles, but we did an LP so that we put all the hits together make it better for all the sales and everything. Was there ever a time where y'all wanted to transition from to another genre of music? Well, we did soca, because we mm-hmm. didn't know soca in Jamaica. It was hard to learn about soca, because to me, when I first, 
I didn't know the difference in all the different islands. But I had to go back and learn everything, what come from Trinidad, what came from Guyana, what come from all the different islands. And we did capitalize on it because the, the scallops of people only sell their records, like a bees or Charlie's. Each of them sell only their product. So I would buy one records from one company, sell the other one. I bought the other company and sell the other one. I was an in-between. And the same thing in Jamaica. The producers only sell their records. Mm -hmm. Cox and Duke Creed, everybody sells their records. But what I did, I wanted to create a one-stop so that when the sound system and the records fan come to buy, they would just come to one source. Instead of going 20 different stores to buy one each record, they were available at one place in my records. Excellent. My record store, so I created a one-stop shop. Why do you think it's so hard to cross over, like for artists to, to blow up here? I feel like, you know, there's one song or one artist that can break through, but there's so much great music that comes from Jamaica, and it doesn't feel like it gets celebrated enough here in the United States. I would say it has a lot to do with the artists themselves and, and the whole music industry. There's a lot behind the music. We have to train to be on time, <laughs> train to be <laughs> obligated, <laughs> trying to work their career as a profession. Because when people in Jamaica used to sing, I think they're just singing because they love to sing, not like a business. But there's a lot to do with the business also because you have to be make sure you be on time and make sure that you're obligated to do what you're supposed to do. So we have a lot, lot of training to do and uh, realize that if you bring up an artist, you don't bring up 20 people with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because That's here too. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the lyrics being risque too? You know, we love our dance hall music, but it can, when you listen to the lyrics, sometimes you're like, oh, that's what they're talking about. Was that ever an issue? Well, I give you a joke. One time my father, when he moved to Ocheres and Soul System was very big there, he would, the sound system would play 24-7 from night and day. And it was dance hall. And he said to me, Pat, I don't know what the hell they're saying. But you know what? I get to love it because they are in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody know what they say sometimes, but it's just the beat and how the rhythm, how they rhyme in the, within the rhythm. I think the DJs are great because they're just speaking from their heart and the musicians too. We didn't, we didn't play from sheet music. They just blow and make a rhythm from just their heart. And uh, so as the DJs, they're just rhyming as they go along. Mm -hmm. When, when uh, we, we used to have um, something like soca, but it's not soca. I don't remember the first, the first ones. But these Calypsonian, they just start music and just make the song as they go along. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever thought about it. They would just say, okay, let's think about bus or let's think about anything and they just create a song as they go along. So I really give a lot of credit to the DJs because they rhyme the rhythm and it sounds so good. You know, they're talking in the rhythm and... Um, that's why I used to love it's just, a, it's just a beautiful creation of uh, their their heart and soul in the music. Uh, after 60 years, why do, why do you still love it, Miss Pat? Because um, it's my culture. Absolutely. I'm Jamaican first, then Chinese and Indian after. But I grew up in the music. I love my culture, and I see the reward. So much people love my music on my travels everywhere. I just hear they love the music. It's the music and, and also the message in the music because, you know, when I usually say reggae music, when you're young, you love the dance hall. When you get a little older, you, you have the roots music. And then when you get a little older, you go for the lover's rock. <laughs> so it will, it's, it's a cycle. Your mood, it's, a vibe. it's a cycle and a vibes that you go through. Who's your favorite artist to listen to? <laughs> I have a lot. <laughs> She can't pick favorites. But you I'm like a roots kids. girl. Mm. I'm a roots girl. I'm in, the, I'm in the message, and it brings back a lot of memory, you know. Through my years, knowing the artists and see where they come from, 
and see the, their success because when they have a success, I feel happy for them too. So it's my success too. You have the same ethnicity as uh, the other VP, Kamala Harris. Yes. Yeah. I'm proud. <laughs> I'm proud of her. <laughs> we, we are a gifted country and we're a gifted. Jamaica is such a tiny place, but it had so many studios and so many artists. I used to see a lot of foreigners come to Jamaica just for the music, the feelings, the atmosphere, the weed, the <laughs> rum. That's right. <laughs> That's everything. Mm -hmm. They just love the people, how, how, how uh, sociable they are, and, and the music. And then they really care about the music with them. Why did you leave Jamaica? I left Jamaica in 1977 because we were going through a political unrest. And we took the kids with us. It was very dangerous. I remember with the riots and things, we had to shut down the shutters two, three times a day, bring in all the vendors. Everybody would come in until the riot was over, then we hoping back. We just, we just felt that we couldn't live that way. Mm -hmm. There was no fun <laughs> doing business. Mm -hmm. So in 1977, we came to the state with my children, and we start all over again. Trying to, in trying to learn the culture of America, <laughs> trying to develop my own culture here, mm -hmm. sending the kids to school, finding where to live, finding where to put up shop. So we choose Jamaica because it reminds us so much of Jamaica. <laughs> Jamaica so Queens. we come yeah, from Jamaica to Jamaica Queens, <laughs> and we live from Randy's to VP Records because we couldn't use the name Randy's. My brother-in-law had that name. So we just use our initial, which is Vincent and Pat. So it became VP Records. Wow. Let's not give away the whole book. Yeah, let's, yeah. The book <laughs> is out. Yeah, the book Pick is the out. Book right. So you'll yeah. find everything in the Hold book. Hold it up, B, what's it? <laughs> Miss Pat, my reggae music journey. And what's mm -hmm. great about it is the pictures in here, too, as you're reading the stories. And you can see some of these pictures from all the stories that she's talking about. Mm -hmm. And these artists, and Miss Pat herself and her family. By the way, it's a family business still, right? Yes, it's my third generation. Mm -hmm. It's from my, my husband and myself and all my children. I have uh, three sons and one daughter, Angela. and they're all in the business. And also my grandson is outside, Stephen, and then Stephanie and Christina and CJ. The four grandkids are in the business. Well, thank you for joining us this morning and taking time out of your day and coming in and giving us some uh, history. That's right. Make yeah. sure y'all go get that book. That's it's right. It's a beautiful, yes. <laughs> amazing book. A lot of information. Miss Pat, it truly is an honor. You are an icon to me and to so many people, so I'm so glad you were able to join us. And I want to thank you all and the Breakfast Club to have me and uh, to, help to share my journey. Thank it's you. been a pleasure, and I'm so happy to be here. Right. Thank you all. Thank and you. thank you to all of the reggae fans out there and the hip-hop fans. <laughs> Thank you for supporting my music for over 60 years. Okay. Big up! Oh, God. That ain't it? That ain't it. Oh. That ain't it. All right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you. 